Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. Feel free to use the chat box for any questions. If we're unable to get to them during the presentation, they will be answered at the end. My name is Braden Knudsen. I will be your host for this webinar. Today we will be pleased to hear from Burke Jackson, who will be giving a presentation titled Wiki, 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 the Research Wiki. Burke Jackson retired from BYU over three years ago after teaching for 40 years in the Marriott School of Business. Two years ago, he and his wife became church service missionaries in, the family history, in family history at the Family History Training Center in Orem, where he taught two different sessions as part of the five-day course. He and his wife are joining the BYU Family History Library as missionaries part-time. Good afternoon. As mentioned by Braden, our topic today is the Family Search Research Wiki. Uh, I've titled it Wiki, Wiki, Wiki for a strange reason, actually. It's in honor of uh, a tour guide that we had for, we have had for years as part of a, an executive MBA trip to Europe every summer for a couple of weeks. And he was an Austrian named Fritz. And anytime we got on a bus to go anywhere, even if it was half an hour, an hour away, uh, everyone, as you may know, if you ride buses on tours, everybody falls asleep instantaneously. And so when we would get somewhere, he would grab the microphone and he'd say, wakey, wakey, wakey. So uh, when I taught this uh, before, I taught it early in the morning, it's nine o'clock session. And so I always wanted to start with uh, wakey, 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 a little, a little, uh, unuseful at this time of the day, but still I'll say wakey, 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 and wiki, wiki, wiki. So we'll begin with some information about the Family Search Research Wiki. So what does it mean? What does a wiki mean? Well, it's, it's a web application. Uh, I'm going to have to read some of this, I guess. It allows people to add, modify, or delete content in collaboration with others. So that's key. You can add content to the wiki. Other people can, and like you will see in Wikipedia, the data on the wiki is uh, as accurate as the people who have put it in. Uh, and so it's Hawaiian for fast. So really what we have with the wiki, research wiki, is fast access to lots of genealogical information. And it holds some content itself, but it has links to much more content. There's over 83,000 articles with links to over 250 uh, countries around the world. So that's, that's the wiki. Uh, specifically, what can it do for us? Well, it can help you begin your family history work. Uh, if you, it's a good place to start. There's just lots of access to data. Help you choose a record to search help you find sources for a record. The catalog in Family Search is kind of an adjunct to the, to the wiki and help you learn to interpret and use a record. You, you will be able to see how you can uh, use languages and, uh, and handwriting that might help you uh, interpret records that you would run into. Help, and you can write contributions to it. I think every month or so, there's more, there are more articles on the wiki, mostly contributed by uh, people uh, like, uh, like you. And it can help you find information for stories, and we know how important stories are uh, these days. So there's our Family Search main page. If you go to the search uh, at the top, you'll get a drop down menu, and there's the wiki. There's also the catalog, records, genealogies, books but we're gonna focus on the, on the wiki today. So here's the wiki main page. Now, one of the things that's happening with the wiki is that uh, Family Search is redoing it and reformatting it. And so some of what I have uh, is a little older, like this one says 80,000, there are now 83,000 articles. And this is a little bit of the old format, but basically this looks a lot like the newest version and the newest version probably will be changing in the next little while as well. In fact, they have warnings on it saying, hey, we're in process of redoing the format. But the basics are still the same. So you'll notice that there are, uh, there are a list of articles, 80,000 articles, and there's a search by place or topic. So the wiki is not a place where you put in somebody's name. 
you put in a place or a topic, and hopefully through that place or topic, you might find information about a particular ancestor, uh, as well as information about the place or the topic. If you're new to the wiki, there's a, a link to how to use the wiki. If you click on that link, you see you get to this page, which is a help wiki help. And you'll see where we've highlighted getting started on the wiki. If you click there, uh, you'll find some information, videos and stuff on how to get started on the wiki. We're not going to go there. We're going to do some searching on the wiki. And so we need to go back to the main page of the wiki. And you can do it three different ways. So we see all these arrows. You can go up at the top and go to search and go down to the wiki like we did at the beginning. You can go over to the wiki home on the left, or you can go to the, the link that says main page. Any one of those three uh, will get you back to the wiki home page. So now we're going to explore. I picked two places to explore, one a country, Germany, and one something in the United States, Indiana. I picked those places because they have some meaning to me, so I'm being selfish, but I'm going to show you what I have found, and hopefully you can relate, and the process will be uh, something that you can uh, follow. So we're going to start with Germany. So if we put in our main wiki page, the name Germany, and click, we get this Germany genealogy main page. Now, you'll even notice there's a warning and there's some letters at the top that are telling you that, hey, we're changing some of the formats and stuff. And this looks different than it did uh, a couple months ago. Uh, and you'll see down at the right, uh, I've highlighted some of the topics and record types that you can get in the German genealogy section. You'll also notice that there's on the bottom left some Germany online records. And that's always helpful to find online records. We're not going to go there. We're going to get to some parts of uh, German genealogy. If you go down further in German gene in that German genealogy page, you find a section called States of Germany in 1871. My people, and it turns out a lot of people, emigrated from Württemberg in Germany. So we're going to find something. We click on Württemberg to find something about Württemberg, and we get this Württemberg German genealogy main page. Um, you'll notice there's some contents, and there's some topics on the left. Um, I haven't really, my wife, uh, through another source, has found a bunch of stuff about people, some of my ancestors in Württemberg, but I'm going to uh, go to another place, which is, we want to know, well, where is it? In order to find where Württemberg is, or wo ist Württemberg in Germany, in German, we're going to go back to the German main page, and just click on there, and go to maps. My wife's a map person. Maybe this is a male-female thing. Whenever we go anywhere, we have to have a map, even if we're going six blocks from where we are. I'm exaggerating. My wife's a map person. She gets us there often. I'm not a map person. Maybe it's a male-female thing. And in my situation, when I rely on my intuition, generally we get lost and have to refer to my wife's maps. So she's a map person. I just want you to know that. So we're going to maps to find out wo ist Württemberg. And we go to German maps, Germany maps, and we see a, a link to German Empire map from research guidance. We click on that, and there is the German Empire from 1871 to 1918. Some of our German ancestors, your German ancestors, may have come before that or after that, and maybe a long time before that. But this is a time, 1871 to 1918, when a lot of uh, our German ancestors left Germany and came to America. And you see, it's a pretty interesting map, actually. You can see Prussia is in the dark, and uh, there's some places there that you might recognize, uh, Saxon and Hanover and a bunch of parts of Germany that are the same names uh, today. But down there on the bottom left is Württemberg. So Württemberg is a, is a uh, region around Stuttgart, not far from Switzerland, not far from France, and it's an interesting place. When I've taught this before, 
uh, many of the people in the room who had German ancestors had ancestors from Württemberg. And I've always been curious. It's always been remarkable that that many who were in the room had ancestors from Württemberg. So I wondered why. So one of the ways uh, I thought I'd find is go back to the Württemberg main page and come down here to a session called Emigration and Immigration. And I just found this out actually yesterday. I've been taught this several times and I hadn't seen this. It may be part of the new part. And there's a, uh, some information about Württemberg immigration. And I, I found it really interesting. And I'll just read this. Uh, you can read it too. Some of the earliest immigrants to America came from the state of Württemberg. It's the area of Germany from which the number of immigrants surpassed any other state. Anyone in America now who has ancestors from Württemberg and would like to trace their roots can rejoice because church records exist in almost every village. And that's unusual. Very few of the church records, Lutheran and Catholic, were destroyed in this part of, the, in this part of Germany in the wars of the 20th century. For the most part, the records go back to the early 1600s and some even earlier. Some of the records were destroyed during the Thirty Years' War in the 1600s. Citizens from surrounding countries, specifically Switzerland, we saw that, migrated to Württemberg because of the devastation of this war to settle certain areas. Others came from France and Austria. So that was the first time I understood why most of the, pe most of the people with German ancestors in the room had ancestors from the same place I did. Württemberg seemed to be a, a good place to leave from to come to America, particularly in the mid 1800s. So when you do German research, you might end up with seeing a document like this. And uh, I can't read this. I don't speak German, uh, but I can see some things on this document that I can read. I can read dates. I can read 1835. What else can I read? I can read uh, names. There's Joseph, there's Helena, there's, what is there, Margaret, there's Caroline. Uh, so there are a lot of Alexander Cullen, that's sort of an interesting name for a German name, and Joseph at the bottom. But I don't know what that document is. I can see some names and dates, but that's all. But there are a couple of key words that we're going to uh, try to find out about, and that's these two words. And if you speak German, you probably know what these mean, but they're very similar almost the same word, maybe different uh, gender, geboren, uh, geboren. And so I thought, all right, let's find out what this document might be about. So we're going to go back to the main German page. We've already looked at maps. We're now going to look at languages. And if we look at languages and click on languages, we get a section about German languages. Interestingly, at the bottom, you see you can also get Danish, French, and Polish, and Portuguese, but the one we were looking for was a German word list. And if we click on that link, we get this uh, keywords list. And these are key genealogy words, uh, all in uh, German, English to German. And you'll notice that the first one uh, has that geboren, geboren, different ways of saying geboren, which means birth. So clearly that previous document had, had something that required birthdays. Maybe it was a birth uh, record, maybe it was a marriage record, whatever record it required to have births in uh, were on that document. So the next thing, struggle we have with that document in any German document is to understand the writing. So the next thing we do is we went from maps to languages to now we're going to look at handwriting. And this is all on the wiki on the, on the German main page. So if we click on handwriting, we get examples of German handwriting. So there's some Roman, German type, and German script. Kind of fun. So if you really were into looking at the German documents, you can look at this handwriting and see what you can find. You can also use Google Translate for words and phrases, which is a great way to, to get go from German to English. But one of the things I found was this cool, I'm going to call it cool, German script tool. It's not part of family search. Uh, you can see that name there. You can maybe jot it down. But uh, in, our, in our, that's my language, cool. In today's language, it would be awesome or bad or sick or something. But it's a, 
it's a cool tool. And what I've done is put my first name in the main place there. And, and it shows what the script that's underlined looks like. So this was the second script that I mentioned that has Burke. Looks very different from the first one. Harder to understand, but that's some of the challenges of dealing with German documents and German language and script. So we're going to go back now to the Wiki homepage in order to explore Indiana, where it turns out that most of my ancestors end up in St. Joe County around South Bend, Indiana. And I suppose it's not surprising they all end up around the same place, but it's, it is surprising that they essentially all of them end up in South Bend, St. Joe, Indiana, and didn't seem to move very much from there. So we're going to look there. And we go to the Indiana uh, genealogy homepage, and we are going to look this time at the online records and see what we can find. And this is what you get when you click on that link to the online genealogy records. You get a bunch of vital records, military records, marriages, et cetera. But if you go down a little bit, this is where I found some success. I went to biographies and the Indiana biographies. Now, I expected not to find very much. My people were not famous. They weren't you know, rich and wealthy landowners or whatever. They were farmers, mostly, and blue-collar people. But under Indiana biographies, I found my, it took a couple clicks, but I found my great, great grandfather, Christian Bucher. And I know it's, it is he from Switzerland, born in 1820. I know that's him, same information I had. Uh, but the important thing on this biography, and there's some funny stuff if you read this biography, but the important thing I found was this uh, at the bottom of the page. And I'll just read it. On November 8, 1849, Mr. Booker took upon unto himself a wife in the person of Miss Mary Smith. I knew that, who was born in Stark County, Ohio. I knew that. Uh, a daughter, this is what I didn't know, of George and Catherine Kiefer, and that's a nice thing about these biographies they gave maiden names, both of whom were born in Germany and came to America with their parents, their marriage occurring at Canton, Ohio, in December 1829. So that, the second half of that, those uh, lines are what uh, was, was new to me, is what was new to me. So, by the way, this was part of a biography, a book of biographies that was written in 1893. So I'm starting to feel like it's pretty accurate because it was written not that long from when these people lived, and some were probably still living. So there was my, this is an old uh, pedigree, but I wanted to show it to you because this is where, where I found some success. So there's uh, my, starts with my father and mother and then goes to Christian Booker and Mary Smith. There they are, my great-great-grandfather and great-great-grandmother. So if you recall, her parents were George, Catherine Kiefer and George Smith. So I thought, well, I'm going to add her parents into the pedigree. And if you're going to add a parent, just to check, which one would you choose? Would you choose George Smith or Catherine Kiefer? I'm choosing Catherine Kiefer because the name is a little more unique. So I put in Catherine Kiefer, female, marriage to George Smith, and did some find. And there at the top of my list was what looked like the right Catherine Kiefer with a spouse, George Smith Jr. So I clicked on her uh, and got her details page, and there she is. Now, I'll, I'll, you be detectives a little bit and see what you think about this Catherine Kiefer. Without looking about where she's from, you can notice she has a bit of an unusual name because she's got a French first name and a German last name. And it's sort of interesting to me who's who knows some French. And in fact, her siblings are Pierre, Jean-Georges, and Jacques Kiefer. So 
along with a couple of others. So that told me something interesting about Catherine Keeper, and you can see it uh, in her details page, that her birth was in a place in France, Urviller, Bas Rhine, uh, France. So in tribute to my wife, we're looking at a map again to find out well, where that, where is that Urviller, France, and it turns out a lot of her ancestors, a lot of uh, uh, going way back, are from that part of France, which is right on the borderline of Germany. Maybe it's called Alsace, but that's Urviller. Okay. So now we're going to come and put in, there's Mary Smith and Christian Bucher, and there's George Smith Jr. and Catherine Kiefer, and when I put them in, it was like a whoosh. As, and maybe you've had this experience when you make the link to a whole bunch of people in family search, it, it's like it fills in in a giant whoosh. And so there's George and Catherine Kiefer. And if you keep going back, it goes to Philip uh, Ludwig Kiefer. And if you go from Philip, Philip Ludwig Kiefer, you go back to Balthazar Barlin. Now, first of all, I'm just excited that I have an ancestor named Balthazar you know, just and Barlin. They're sort of French names, I guess, because I think they're all from around that part of France slash Germany. Uh, so I got really excited about this whoosh that happened and all the people that filled in and took me back to 1576. So I'm going to call it a research wiki success, going from Mary Smith, where I had a brick wall, uh, back to Balthazar Barlin in 1576. But, as you, you all know, the but is, do I have sources for any of this? This is only as accurate as the sources that we might have. So I've been able to do some of the source work, and so I feel pretty good about a lot of this, but I'm always uh, tempered by, uh, you know, what, what do we really have sources for and does it really happen? But it was fun, and that's a fun part of family history, by the way is finding something like that. All right, we're going to look at more bios because, as I said, many of my people uh, came from this part of Indiana, St. Joe County, South Bend. So I've had a debate with a very distant cousin about one of my ancestors being Eager or Edgar. I say Eager, she says Edgar. Eager, Edgar. All right? So I thought, well, I'll look in the biographies and see if I find, because I know this, my ancestor was in the same part of the world. So here's what I found in a bio. I found Charles Eager indicted in 1858 for the murder of Charles Kelly. So I thought, well, maybe I don't want to be Eager. All right, maybe I'd rather be Edgar. But if you keep reading, it says, on trial, the evidence seemed conclusive that murder was done in self-defense and the accuser was acquitted. So I breathed a bit of sigh of relief and I thought, okay, I can be an eager. But the same defendant was afterward convicted of manslaughter. So I was sort of hesitant about whether I wanted to be related to this Charles Eager. And by the way, I couldn't find that I was related, but it is an eager and there aren't that many. But the funniest thing about this, by the way, and this is a bio biography that was published in 1880, it's in a section of the biography called Dark Deeds. I'm just, I just find that sort of humorous. I feel like I'm watching Harry Potter. We got a course on Dark Deeds. We got Charles Eager. So I don't know whether this is my eager, but you know, suffice to say, we move on to another biography. That is a Jackson. That's my name. This is my great grandfather, Joseph T. Jackson. Again, none of these people were famous. That was the best thing about this. And it's, I know it's him, He's born in the right place, the right time. And it says, his parents, John and Elizabeth Eager Jackson. Eager, okay? So I'm convinced, plus some other stuff, I've seen the gravesite and all that, that convinces in my mind that I'm right and my distant cousin is wrong. She's not going to believe it. But... It was done in 1880, and we're thinking that they might have a pretty good idea of what her name was. So that's my one bio. Now we're going to move on to topics. And we, when we move on to topics, we go back to the family, search, uh, or family history research wiki 
main page. And one of the patrons we had a year or two ago when we had this presentation, she said, I know exactly what I want to search on a topic. And she said, I want to search the ship Brooklyn because I had a great, great grandmother named Laura Goodwin who was on the ship Brooklyn and died. And I don't know more than that. I just know that she died on the ship. So we put in Ship Brooklyn, we see what we get, and we get a page about the Ship Brooklyn. Uh, and it is a ship that took 239, you see at the very top, Latter-day Saints from New York City to San Francisco in 1846. All those years should mean something. But we had a link to the voyage of the Brooklyn that was an article written in Dialogue in 1988. So if we click on that, we see the story of the ship Brooklyn. November 8th, 1845. This is actually fascinating uh, on, uh, if, if you have pioneer ancestors uh, who are LDS or not. It's still fascinating. 8th of November, 1845. Saints, Latter-day Saints in the Eastern States gathered together in New York City and listened to Apostle Orson Pratt say... <laughs> Rather than away, be determined to get out of this evil nation by next spring. We don't want one saint to be left in the United States by that time. Let every branch in the north, south, east, and west be determined to flee Babylon, either by land or by sea. So we know lots of stories of the people who went by land uh, in the 1846-47 time frame. But I had not heard much about this, this and maybe some of you have. Uh, anyway, so here's the, the journey that was the planned route for these 238 uh, 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 members of the Latter-day uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints at the time. They were to leave New York, go around South America, the Cape Horn. They were going to stop in Valparaiso for uh, supplies and then end up in San Francisco. So that's a that's a twenty four thousand mile journey that these two hundred and thirty eight men, women, and children were to take. It's quite remarkable, and so we searched in that uh, article for Laura Goodwin because this was the name that our patron said was her great great grandmother who died on the ship, and there was Laura Goodwin. So we'll we'll highlight that. Unfortunately, the Brooklyn never reached Valparaiso, that's in Chile. While trying for the, that port, another Seville gale drove the ship back against the Cape. And then the storm, they had had another storm that had uh, in the Atlantic, and you'll see where that took them in a little bit. One sailor was washed overboard, was able to hang on the floating board, but Laura Goodwin, pregnant and traveling with her husband Isaac, and seven children lost her footing thrown down a companionway, went into premature labor, and then uh, died. And she pled that she not be buried in the sea. So that's the sad story of this uh, woman's great-great-grandmother. So if we look at the, at the end of the article, they have a list of the people who are on that ship. And you might, some of you may be related to some of them, but to, to any of them, but here's the Goodwin family, who is Isaac and Laura and six children, actually had seven children. Um, and interestingly, the leader of this group is Samuel Brannan. So if you know anything about Mormon history and Samuel Brannan, he ends up in California with these people and gets involved in some gold rush and stuff like that. So that's interesting. So here's more. This is a church news article who talks about this trip and what it might have been like to take these 238 people uh, 24,000 mile on a 24,000 mile journey in a relatively small ship. Um, and then they sailed, interestingly, on February 4th, 1846, coincidentally the same day the Saints left Nauvoo, Illinois. Uh, lived in cramped quarters, low ceilings, suffered seasickness, 
blew them almost to the Cape Verde Islands off the coast of Africa. Now, we're going to see a map that says that's not as strange as it seems, but still, uh, I can't imagine doing this, by the way. Storms battered them around the, uh, around the horn, scurvy, water supply problems, gale winds blew them back into the Antarctic waters, all out to the, the Juan Fernandez Islands, made famous by Defoe and Robinson Crusoe. Here, Laura Goodwin, mother of seven, was buried. First Mormon service ever held in the Southern Hemisphere. So uh, this is this is that same thing, talking about Laura Goodwin being buried at this uh, Masa Tierra, uh, and it's an island that's made famous, a real island made famous by Defoe and Robinson Crusoe. So here's the journey that they took. Again, if you put that in perspective to the journey from, from the Midwest to Salt Lake City, it's I mean, as tough a journey as that was. This is, this is one that is just remarkable. There's New York, Cape Verde. So they got blown off almost to the Cape Verde Islands off of Africa, came around trying to get to Valparaiso, but couldn't because of the winds. So they went to the Juan Fernandez Islands. And then from there to the Sandwich Islands, which is Hawaii, and then finally to San Francisco. So that's the journey. Uh, I don't know how many died on the trip. I, it's probably part of the article. I know there's some who died besides Laura Goodwin, but most made it. And so there's, there's a map of Chile. Valparaiso is a little north of Santiago. It's probably 70 miles north of Santiago. And that uh, indicator is where the Juan Fernandez Islands are. So there's a little uh, sort of tribute to Laura Goodwin. Along with the pleasures of going ashore, however, was the sad task of burying their dear sister, Laura Goodwin. Although the occasion was so sorrowful, the presence of the six little children sobbing in uncontrollable grief and the father in his loneliness trying to comfort them. Still, such was our weariness of the voyage that the sight of and tread upon terra firma once more was such a relief from the ship life that we gratefully realized and enjoyed it. So they ended up getting uh, water, fresh water, fruit, etc., on this island. So here's the island, the San Juan Islands, San or Juan Fernandez Islands, and here's where they landed at this uh, bay, and here is uh, the Robinson Crusoe Cave. So that's that's our last topic that we're gonna talk about. You can put anything in, in topics. You could put, uh, my wife taught a session on LDS records, and, and you could put LDS records there and find stuff about pioneers. Uh, in this case, we looked at uh, the ship Brooklyn. So you're now somewhat wiki literate. So go explore using the wiki, a, a great source for lots of data uh, and links to countries and articles all over the world. Thanks. Thank you, webinar. We apologize for some of the sound issues that we had. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and type those in the chat box now. This webinar will be posted on the website later this afternoon and will be posted onto YouTube within the coming days. Um, go make sure to go and look at the our Family History Library webinar website to see the upcoming schedule and which webinars will be hosted um, in the upcoming days. Thank you very much.